Her Night in Shining Stone is book one in the Gargoyle Shifters of New York City series. Published by Harley Romance Publishing, 2022. Chapter 1. Roman. The city below buzzes like a beehive, people rushing back and forth from their jobs and social events. People busy with the daily running of things in their hectic lives, not slowing down for one moment to see what is around them, nor what towers over them. My brothers and I sit, frozen, on top of one of the oldest buildings in New York, the Public City Library. Three stories up and not the most impressive of skyscrapers, yet we hold a long-forgotten secret, one that we protect every night. The sun descends out of the sky, dropping away like a ball of heat into a pool of water. My entire body tingles, heat running down the length of my spine like a hot waterfall, trickling out toward my pointed tail and frozen wings. Only a few more moments of waiting and I will awaken, thank the heavens for that. Dimitri, my daytime caretaker, shouts out to me but I can't respond to him yet. He should know that by now. The magic that binds us takes away our human form and heals us through the day will wear off soon. My skin splinters and I stretch, pain ricocheting through my body as I stand, letting my now human muscles lengthen. Whoa. That's a rush. My head spins and not from the height. It's getting harder and harder to shift back from my gargoyle state after sundown. My mate must be found. For over a hundred and twenty years I have been waiting for her, to no avail. Darkness falls and my brothers move. I stand at the front of the building, yet when I turn my head I can see them shifting behind me. Roman? Are you all right? Dimitri's insistent voice makes me leap up onto the rooftop next to where he stands watching. My handler has noticed the changes in me. The stiffness, the pain that comes more frequently. He's never said anything specific though, and I am grateful for the respect he shows me. I lay my hand on Dimitri's arm. Of course, my friend. Take your leave. Thank you. Dimitri inclines his head and bows away, his heavily armed body slinking into the night with his comrades, the men who protect us while we sleep during the day. When we are frozen in our gargoyle form through the daylight hours, we are vulnerable to attack. Some of our distant family in Chicago have been killed this past year, murdered while vulnerable. After that, my brothers and I increased our protection from one lazy guard to several professionals led by Dimitri. Roman. What's the plan tonight, my brother? Nate, the youngest of the four of us, comes at me with a grin, his happy face something I miss in the dark hours of my daytime cursed life. Our other brothers, Raphael and Gabriel, stretch and head my way too. I believe the expression is, let's party like it's 1999. I chuckle as all three brothers rolls their eyes. It's the 21st century, Roman. Get a grip, Nate says. Raphael and Gabriel turn away from our conversation to leave the building our usual way, stepping up onto the ledge and spreading their wings out wide. You guys going straight to Nova? I ask. It's our favorite local bar. Full of alcohol, willing women, and the place is dark enough that the patrons don't often notice the silver in our eyes that give us away to anyone who knows what we are. Yes. I want to go with them, but my wings need a stretch and something is bugging me tonight. I know that the time has come. That I need to do more than party away my loneliness. There is a siren calling to me from the north of the city. I am listening. I'm going for a spin. Meet up with you guys later. Gabe, the closest to me in age, turns. You want some company? Not really. No. All good. I'll see you in a few hours. My three brothers blacken out the city lights for a moment with their wings as they take to the sky, and together, they soar above the roofline of New York City. A city, they say, that never sleeps. My heart is telling me to take to the skies and head in a different direction to my brothers. I will go wherever my heart leads. I have to. My survival depends on it. I stretch my wings out wide, the strength and the extensions of my back making me smile. Old I may be, but I am the strongest of us. For now at least. 
Our elders warned me of the risks of staying unmated for so long. They said an insanity would settle in the longer I remained alone, and there have been stories of suiciding gargoyles who were unmated. The clock is ticking and my heart knows it. I hope it will know where to find her, and soon. I fly up and around the huge buildings that crowd my beautiful city. New York has changed a lot in the century I've watched the city grow. Horses and carts have been replaced by brightly colored machines, and the small multi-storied houses and shops have been knocked down to make way for buildings that reach up toward the sky. Something unexpected pulls at me, tugging me downward without warning. Fuck, what's that? My heart begins to pound like a galloping horse toward the final flag. I give in to the urge and fly lower, a strange heat filling up my belly, weakening my body. Finally, I fall to the ground, my wings folding into my back and becoming invisible to the human eye. A light shines from a cafe window ahead, and I walk forward to see what my heart wants me to find. I stop and stare, unable to tear my eyes from the woman serving a table in the small restaurant. She has wildly curly long red hair. The word untamable instantly comes to mind. She smiles at the couple she's serving, and I drop to my knees, light piercing my chest as both pain and the most incredible pleasure filters through me. My beloved. I found her. She's my one and only. I take a few deep breaths to try and calm my racing heart. The poor organ wants to jump right out of my chest. I know. Relax. I know. I'll get her. Beloveds are often fragile humans, but once our union is completed, she will become immortal. Like me. I push myself to my feet, feeling strangely drunk as I stagger to the door of the restaurant. No one has ever prepared me for how this would feel. I always thought I'd see my beloved, kiss her, and then talk her into living forever. Done. I've never experienced a true romantic love before, and although I've always known it existed, somewhere, the feelings flooding my body now are far more powerful and overwhelming than I expect. My connection to my brothers is the only true thing I have ever felt. Until now. This. This is something else. Once inside, I fall into a black chair, my legs weak and wobbly. I grab for the menu. Gargoyles can eat only meat, the rarer the better. Almost everything else makes us very sick. Hello. Can I help you? The waitress, my beloved, stands over me with eyes the size of swimming pools. Can she feel the connection? The pull between us? I hope so. Hello. I will have three T-bone steaks. As rare as possible. Blue, actually. Please. Her eyes widen further, not an unusual reaction in humans when they hear my deep baritone. No matter how hard I try, the ancient accent I was born with will not change. Yes, of course. Ah. I do I know you. She places a small dainty hand on my table as if to steady herself, and her bright blue eyes gaze at me like she's never seen someone like me before. Which in truth, she likely hasn't. No. But I'd like to know you. I can pick you up after your shift. I, um. Her head swivels around to look back at the kitchen. I have a boyfriend. A deep anger settles into my gut with the weight of stone. I swallow down the groan of possession that rises like a tide, hot and tight. That is no matter. I will sit here until closing. She opens her mouth as though to say something else, but then changes her mind. Closing it, and with a nod, she disappears to do her work. My steaks arrive ten minutes later, and I begin to eat, consuming the warm flesh, feeling my strength renew. She is poetry in action, with the sensuality of a siren and the cuteness of a kitten all in one. What an incredible woman fate has chosen for me. I send up a silent prayer. Thank you. What will she be like to come home to each evening? Where does she live now? Not that it matters now. I have enough money to buy her anything she likes. If she doesn't want to stay in the apartment my brothers and I share, she can choose something else. But she must live somewhere close to the library, so I can watch her through the days. The night wears on, but I don't tire of watching her interact with the other patrons, 
nor the way she shoots me interested, hungry looks to see if I am still here. When she looks at me her pupils dilate, and her beautiful red lips part as though she struggles for breath. As I search inside my mind for all the information I have on gargoyle human unions, I draw a blank. I should have paid closer attention to the elders from Chicago when they spoke of this. There is no one to ask now. They've all been killed. Canada. There are elders there. I could go tonight, ask them what I must do. Hey. You know I can't go home with you, yeah? The woman, my gorgeous beloved, slides up next to me and sits down in the chair opposite me. Why? Because you have a boyfriend? She nods. Yes. He's the chef. He won't like you even giving me this much attention, so please, go. Before he gets angry. Her gaze darts from me to the kitchen and back. Could she be afraid of this man who should protect her? I cock my head, not giving a royal flying fuck about the boyfriend. I will tear him into pieces if I have to. Are you happy, ah? Uh? I glance down at her name tag, and the name I read doesn't seem to match her. Susie? She covers it with one hand. Oh, I left my name tag at home. My name's Christiana Chrissy for short. Christiana. The name rolls off my tongue the way her honeyed pussy soon will. She shivers as though she hears my inner thought. Are you happy, Christiana? Um, I... She leans forward, and one of her stray curls falls over her cheek. I reach over and brush it away using the tips of my fingers. It doesn't seem like you're very happy with this boyfriend of yours. She can't be. Fate would not choose a beloved for me, who was happy and loved by another. I simply do not believe that. Christiana shivers and bites her lip, a soft moan reaching my ears, though she tries to stifle the sound. Her pupils dilate further, until I can barely see the blue of her irises. Who are you? she asks not moving. I am Roman. I am here for you. Her mouth falls open, and I clench my jaw in an effort not to move closer. The need to kiss her is strong. A uniformed man storms out of the kitchen and grabs her arm, yanking her to her feet. What are you doing? he demands in a loud voice, and she cringes, though I'm not sure whether the cringe is caused by his tone or the pain of his grip around her arm. I jump to my feet, grab him by the back of his dirty chef's shirt and yank him away from her. She falls forward and I catch her so she doesn't stumble. It's lucky everyone else has gone home, because I have a feeling this is going to get messy. Don't ever touch her again. I growl, stepping in front of her to shield her as the man, obviously her boyfriend, clenches his fists as though he wants to brawl with me, right here in the restaurant. I don't mind. Something inside tells me I'll enjoy hitting this asshole. There is no one else around, and it won't matter if he sees me for what I am. No one will believe him. They never do. Humans have no concept of how many paranormal creatures are around them every day. I stare at him, and he falters, seeing something in my eyes that I know he will interpret as unearthly. And he will be right. The coward backs away, going into the kitchen once again, and Christiana rounds on me, rubbing her arm. Why'd you do that? He's going to be so mad at me now. Please, please. Just go. Her lower lip trembles and my jaw clenches. I try not to roll my eyes. Him upset? Like I care. I have a beloved to unite with, and three brothers to keep alive. One ugly, angry human means nothing. It does not matter. After tonight, you will know only me. Her arms fall to her sides limp. What do you mean? How will I know you? How do I know you? There is only one way to show her. I step forward and pull her close, letting my hands wrap around her tiny waist. When she tilts up her head, I take my time and stare down into her perfect face. Your eyes are silver. She whispers as though telling me something I don't know, and yet she seems unfazed. Which is good. Most humans freak out when they see my eyes. I know. I drop my head and let our lips meet for the very first time. She gasps against my mouth and I inhale her scent. Orange perfection, sweet and slightly tangy. I press closer, 
sweeping my tongue into her mouth to taste her and so that she can also taste me. Christiana's arms slide around me, holding me tight, as though I would move away. Never. She moans softly, the sexiest sound I've ever heard, and lust slams into my groin with a swift kick. I let my hands explore her plump ass, wishing we were home already so I could enjoy her body properly. The sound of a shotgun being cocked interrupts our kiss. I push my beloved away, spin around, and extend my wings to cover the breadth of the room. Though invisible to the human eye, they will protect Christiana if the guy with the gun does something stupid. The moron boyfriend has a gun pointed straight at my chest. He doesn't know I am an immortal. Even more of an idiot. Leave fuckwit. Now. He spits at me, and I grin back, exposing my razor-sharp teeth. He blinks, obviously unsure of what he is seeing. Oh my god, are they wings? Christiana squeals behind me. Well, that's something I've learned today. My beloved can see my wings. Yes, she's definitely mine. No human has ever seen my true form before. The dickhead in front of me, however, has no idea what he is dealing with. I am going to take Christiana home. You will never see her again. Do you understand? I speak slowly so the idiot can keep up. He continues to point the gun at me, and my temper snaps. I stride forward and the gun goes off blasting into my side. It burns, but only pushes my temper higher. I grab the old gun and break it in half, the screech of metal piercing the silence of the room. The scent of urine stinks up the air, and I look down to see the chef standing in a yellow puddle. Lovely. I give him a disgusted look, retract my wings and turn around. Christiana hasn't fainted as I expected her to. Instead, she grabs white cloth napkins and runs to me, pressing them into my side where a faint red blush stains my white t-shirt. You're hit, she cries, her worry for me clearly overwhelming her fear. And he, and he. I'm fine. He missed, I push the napkins away. He didn't miss. I. She stops, staring up at me again with her beautiful big eyes. Are you an angel? Close enough. I'm taking you home. My home. But my stuff. My clothes, my photos, my... He's going to be so angry. I groan and try to hold on to my patience. I can buy you anything you need. She reaches out and grips my arm. Please. I need to go get my things before he burns them all. He's so horrible, you have no idea. He'll destroy everything I love. Please. Never having been a human, I don't understand their obsession with earthly possessions, but as her eyes well up, I know this is a fight I am going to lose. All right. Let's go. I'm not leaving you alone. She nods. No problem. Our apartment isn't far. Can we go now? She seems agitated, and it's probably due to the dipshit behind me. Yes. I grab her hand and drag her from the restaurant. Her waitressing days are done. Where's your apartment, beloved? She gives me a strange look at the endearment but just says, there. She points up at the second level of an old apartment block. I follow her into the dinky little building and let her pick up her things. Her life and mine are about to change and neither of us truly know how much. Chapter 2 Christiana Oh my god, oh my god. What on earth am I doing? I reach for the photo albums my parents left me when they died. Three generations of family in two albums. Priceless. I keep packing, using the few suitcases I have. What am I doing? Packing up my whole life to move out with a man I barely know. Not that staying is an option now. Fear ripples through me like a storm taking over my arms and legs and making me move faster. Greg has always been violent, and I've had more than a few black eyes over the past few years. But it's been manageable, until tonight. He'll never let me forget this. What was I thinking, flirting with a stranger like that in front of him? Not that I had a choice. Not really. Something that felt magical encouraged me from the very start. 
I haven't been able to control any of it. Not that that is really any excuse. Greg is going to freak. He is probably on his way here now to kill me. A whimper rises in my throat as my eyes burn with unshed tears. What have I done? Back at the restaurant, I couldn't stop looking at this man named Roman. At the man taking me away from Greg. When he kissed me, it was like my heart clicked into place for the first time in my whole life and I was home. Tears well in my eyes, hot and stinging, and I blink them away. Focus. What else do I need? I grab my beloved black jeans, my old sweater, and some of my best underwear. I don't have much room for anything else. I zip up the suitcases and stand up, blowing out a deep breath, and saying goodbye to the only home I've known in recent years. I huff out a laugh at the thought. Home. Not much of a one, really. Yeah, goodbye shithole. You were home for too long, but I... My courage runs out, as do my words. Hurry. Before Greg arrives. I turn toward the front door and pull the suitcases to the stairs, pulling them down one loud step, before Roman is there, taking them from me. I'll carry them. I smile my thanks and follow the hunky angel down the stairs. Why me? Not that I should ask such a thing. I know I should shut my mouth, say thank you, and hope to hell I haven't just jumped from the frying pan into the fire. I shake my head. I don't have a choice. If Greg finds me, the beatings I've had in the past will pale into distant memory. I know that. He is possessive, and he is mean. A part of me had liked that about him. The bad boy who wanted me, and wasn't afraid to show me who was boss. In the beginning, that had been the attraction. But then it got out of hand, and I've been trapped. For years. They say better the devil you know, but what if you have an angel offer you a home instead? We step out into the cool night air, and I glance around, half expecting Greg to show up guns blazing yet again. My eyes dart back and forth, my throat clogging with fear. Stop. Just stop. He won't hurt you with the angel looking over you. What sort of man pulls a gun in a restaurant? Dickhead. I still can't believe he did that. So Roman, where are we going? To heaven, maybe. He grins at me, his teeth unusually sharp. The better to eat you with, my dear. We're going back to my family's apartment. We own a few floors on Park Street. I almost fall flat on my face, stumbling along the sidewalk. Only the richest part of New York City. Ah, okay. I follow him through the city, my tired legs screaming for a rest. I've already pulled a 60 hours of work this week. Running through New York at midnight is a bit past me this week. Here we are, he announces as I puff to keep up with him. I nod, unable to speak through my panting as we walk inside a huge new apartment building. I stop, the brightness and glamour of the foyer making me blink. Roman moves toward the elevators, swiping a card to be allowed entry. I don't think I've ever been anywhere that needs one of those. We step into the carriage, and effortlessly float up into the heavens. Am I dreaming? Did I die walking across the street tonight? This cannot be real. Wow. How high are we going? I ask as the number on the elevator wall climbs and climbs. The penthouse. Of course. Roman smiles at me as the elevator slows, and then the doors ting open. Brothers. He said brothers, right? There is a beautiful white door with a guard beside it. I know the man is a guard because he wears a dark suit, a watchful expression, and has a gun strapped to his belt. Why do they need guards? Are your brothers home? Have I come home with a man who is planning on gang raping me? Not likely. Remember the wings? My heart is racing in my chest as I force my feet to move forward, following Roman into the foyer of the penthouse floor. Has my impulsive nature gotten me into another ridiculous situation? Bill, this is Christiana, Roman says to the guard. She is to be protected at all times. The man nods once. Of course, sir. I gape at him, but he doesn't pay me too much mind. Roman opens the front door and drags my old suitcases inside the apartment. Come on in. 
this is your new home. Unless of course it doesn't suit you. In which case we can choose a new home. My eyes can't seem to process everything all at once. This is the sort of home you see in the movies. Perfection, on every level. Wow. I wrap my arms around my middle, hoping I don't touch anything I'm not meant to. I tend to muck up everything around me, without even meaning to. I, oh, it's all beautiful. Roman doesn't seem moved by my words, but I can't get over the place. Every surface is glistening with cleanliness, and the minimalist furniture is huge and designer quality. Where can I put my things? He looks at me, those incredibly surreal silver eyes shimmering with purpose. I'd like you to sleep in my room tonight. I swallow hard, not sure how I should handle this one. I barely know you, Roman. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can. He marches forward. My breath catches as he pulls me in close and kisses me. Those hot perfect lips press into mine and steal away any rational thought. I grab for his huge biceps, the muscles flexing and bulging beneath my hands. My knees are weak, and as I begin to fall against him, his hands grab me and lift me up, my legs wrapping around his thin waist. He groans loudly and I cling to him, his tongue ravishing my mouth. His taste is as close to dark chocolate as I can imagine a man tasting. He begins to walk, and I don't care where we are going as long as he doesn't stop kissing me. Heat travels through my body like it's on fire, but in the best possible way. Wow. These are not feelings I'm used to. He stops and untangles me, breaking our lips apart to pull at my clothes. My heart sings out in despair at our separation. I need to get close to him again. I step back and rip at my clothes, desperate to get out of my horrible uniform. So much for saying no to him. I can't seem to control myself around Roman. A growl rolls through him that sounds animal-like. The sound ramps up my need even higher. Who are you? What are you? I ask. Part of me knows he isn't an angel. Angels surely don't have teeth like that. But I know one thing for certain. Roman and I are meant to be together. And he obviously isn't fully human. I don't care. After the life I've been dealt, I deserve a bit of happiness, and a hot angel, devil or vampire, whatever he is, is just what the doctor ordered. I stare at him, and his clothes melt off his body. He certainly looks like a god. His muscles bulge with strength. His body is so cut that I can see all eight of his abs and my mouth begins to water. You are so beautiful, I say, unable to stop myself. He steps forward and picks me up, swinging me into his arms like I weigh nothing. If this is a dream, I never want to wake up. I didn't mean to say that aloud either, but nothing about tonight seems real. What's the bet? I really am asleep and dreaming? About a white knight swooping in to save me from my train wreck of a life. You're not dreaming. He growls as he lays me down and jumps on top of me, his hot hard body pressing me into the mattress. I wind my arms around his strong neck and lift my lips for his kiss. Chapter 3 Roman As I lie panting next to my beloved, who has passed out beneath me, my heart feels like it has literally been ripped out of my chest. I glance down. No. No blood. I can still hear it too, pounding away like an anvil against my sternum. What the hell was that? Not sex. Sex doesn't take your soul and rip it out, giving it to the person whose body you are sharing. I lie down to try to still the racing of my heart, pulling Christiana into me. I am almost certain that I have completed the union without meaning to. So much for speaking to the elders about the best way to do it. It seemed all it takes is finding the right person and joining your body with theirs. I stroke her creamy skin, wishing she'd wake up again so we can do it all over. But she sleeps on, her magnificent hair sprawled all over my pillow. Wonder fills me. I have a beloved. A true soulmate. A person to keep me grounded, sane and happy for the rest of my days. So long as I can stay alive. I hug Christiana tighter to my chest, a voice in the lounge area signaling the return of my brothers. I glance at the clock. 
They are earlier than expected. I kiss my beloved on the forehead, roll out of bed, and make sure she's covered with warm blankets. She is nestled under the covers with a contented look on her face that makes my body ache to get back into the bed with her. But I want to know what is going on with my brothers, so I grab a pair of black jeans and tug them on, the worry from the past months coming back to haunt me. Gargoyle shifters are a rare breed, and someone is killing off our kinsmen. The bastards, whoever they are, don't appear to have made it to New York yet, but it is only a matter of time, I am certain. What their problem is with us, I don't know. We exist with the humans well. We don't feed off them nor hurt them. I'm still confused why some group has decided that it is time for us to die. But that isn't going to happen to me. I have more to live for now. We will have to double the security. For all of us. Roman? I walk through the archway, gently closing my bedroom door behind me. The most handsome of my brothers turns toward me. Raphael's smile is dirty. Got some company, brother? No wonder you didn't join us at Nova. Nate has two women with him, one under each arm. He gives me a drunken grin, before they stagger off to his bedroom. For the first time, I feel sorry for Nate. It wasn't that long ago that my loneliness caused me to bury myself in any woman who'd have me. With our fortunate good looks, few women turn my brothers or me down. No longer will that be me. I do, Rafe. Pride laces my tone. My beloved. My brother's jaw drops and his eyes open wide. Are you serious? Yes. I rub my chest, still surprised to find there isn't a gaping hole there. Everything still feels so different and unusual. Although I have to tell you, the union was more painful than I thought it would be. I feel like I've had my heart ripped out. I want to meet her. Rafe starts to storm past me and I grab him by the arm, throwing him backwards. Later. She is asleep and has had a rough night. My brother glares at me, but I stare him down. No one, not even my own brothers, would dare come between me and my beloved. I only want to meet her, Rafe finally complains, dropping his challenging gaze. I encourage my brother back to the couch with a grip on his shoulder. I know. You will. Give her a few hours. Tell me what troubles you. I can read Rafe better than anyone, and he is worried about something. His eyes are darting this way and that like he is on some sort of paranoia drug. Have you been sampling the human's marijuana again, brother? Rafe rolls his eyes at me and relief floods my chest. No. I hate that shit makes me feels like a simpleton. So what's the problem? Rafe runs a hand through his short dark hair. I've had word from our cousins in Los Angeles. That is unusual. We rarely have any communication with other gargoyle families, anymore. Really? How come? The Delacorte brothers are dead. Pain explodes inside my head. No. I jump up and begin to pace, unable to sit still with the pain coursing through me. That cannot be. Why? Why would someone do this to us? Do you think it's the same group that killed the Chicago brothers? All gargoyles are linked from the original maker. We were not sired, we were made. Yes, Thomas who I spoke to believes so. It's all too similar, the pattern of destroying them. These monsters wait until the middle of the day, when we are at our most vulnerable. Kill off the protectors, then push the gargoyles to their death. Thomas told me that his brothers were shattered into a thousand pieces. He only survived because he got caught on the side of the roof. Raphael stops to run a shaking hand through his hair. Can you imagine it, brother? Being able to hear and see your attacker, and yet be frozen, unable to do anything to save yourself. I stop pacing and flex my fingers, the joints cracking and popping as anger vibrates through my body. Who would do this, Rafe? And why? What the hell does anyone have to gain by killing us off? Who's trying to kill you off? Christiana's sweet voice weaves its magic into the room, relaxing me instantly. I turn to see my beloved wrapped in a blanket, her untamable hair spilling over the covers. Come over and meet my brother, beautiful. 
Christiana shuffles over, holding the blanket tight to her body, exposing none of the beauty that she shared with me earlier in the night. Christiana, this is my brother Raphael. Raph, this is Christiana, my beloved. She giggles at the name, she clearly assumes is only an endearment. Nice to meet you, Raph. She leans into me, and I scoop her up, sitting down on the couch and cuddling her into my lap. So, brother, how did this happen? Raph asks stiffly, indicating the human in my arms, who is nestling into me and purring like a kitten. None of us know much about the beloved human, destined for each of us. Raph is suspicious, and probably quite envious as well. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I felt a strange tug tonight. Here. I tapped my chest over my heart. So I went flying, to find whatever was pulling at me. Then bam, it hit me in the chest again. I landed, saw her, and the rest is history. Pretty amazing, actually. Living for over a century with nothing but my love for you three to keep me going, and now, I feel totally different. I see the jealousy in my brother's gaze, his silver eyes narrowing and darkening with shadows. I smile at him with as much kindness as I can inject. Yours will find you too, brother. Have no fear. Fate is kind. Christiana presses a small warm hand to my cheek. Did you just say, over a century? You're joking, right? You can't be older than thirty-five. When I don't answer, she narrows her eyes. How old are you? I stare down at my beloved, fighting the need to kiss her. I think I should take you back to bed. Rafe scowls at me. You didn't tell her yet? That's not fair, Roman. I grin at him and stand up with my beloved in my arms. Back to bed we go. I had no chance earlier. You'll understand when it happens for you. But I think it's time to explain. I smile down at Christiana. Let's go, beautiful. I nod to my brother and head off, wondering where Gabriel is. Probably off with another human girl somewhere. I gather my beloved close to my chest, walk back into our bedroom, shut my door, and lay my girl on the bed unwrapping her like she's a present. Yum. I press kisses to her flesh. Her hands cup my face, tugging me up to her. Are you going to explain? Probably best. In a few hours, I will turn into a statue and disappear on her. I don't want that confusion for my beloved. Yes. My name is Roman Mansevich. I am a gargoyle shifter. Her big blue eyes blink once as though in slow motion. This will test how tough she is. Pardon me? I change into a gargoyle during the day. At night, I am free to move around the city. My wings are usually invisible to the human eye, but being my beloved, you could see them when I flex them in the restaurant tonight. She swallows her slender neck working hard. Ah, all right. Say I believe you. What does that mean then? Gargoyles have only one true mate, a beloved who is their other half. She nods. Like a soulmate. Yes. Someone who pulls us in, as you did to me. An undeniable attraction, a taste, a smell. We unite and bond for eternity. As a gargoyle shifter, I am immortal, as you will be too. That gets her attention. She sits up on the bed, her soft breasts bouncing and getting my attention. Her eyes bulge. Are you telling me you can't die? That I can't die? Well, not with bullets or anything stupid like that. There is one way to kill a gargoyle, and that is to destroy him while in statue form. I am vulnerable then. Is that what you and Rafe were discussing when I came into the room? Yes. We have lived in peace for most of our existence. We don't harm anyone. In fact, we live a very quiet life. I have some investments I manage, our money stream, etc., but we have no sworn enemies, and our numbers are so few we rarely attract attention. Then why? She bites her lip. It's one of the sexiest things I've ever seen. Focus. Honestly, I don't know. Someone has found out about us. Not only what we are, but how to kill us. The latter is something that only those closest to us know. 
Someone has betrayed us, and the hatred is spreading. There were deaths in Chicago last year, and now, Los Angeles. The murders are spreading across the United States, and I am afraid for my gargoyle brothers. You protect them? I shrug. I have always done my best, as I am the oldest. But all of us are vulnerable during the day. That is why I have hired the best protectors for us, but it may not be enough. She shuffles closer and curves her body against me. Well, you have me now. I stare down at her, the rosy flush against her cheeks proclaiming her humanity. So you believe me? I ask. I have no idea what I believe, but I'm too happy to care at the moment. Happier than I've been in a decade, and I don't want common sense to ruin that. She sighs and nestles closer, her breathing slowing down as sleep pulls her into its embrace. I kiss her cheek and hold her close. What has happened to cause her so much unhappiness? I will find out. Although I am impatient by nature, we have forever. I watch Christiana sleep for the final hours of the night, shaking her awake before sunrise. Good morning, beautiful. I have to say goodbye for the day. Goodbye? Why? She snuggles closer, her gorgeous warmth something I will indeed miss through the long day. I need to get into position, or I won't heal. Not to mention the pain I would be in, frozen inside without the kiss of the sun on my body. I don't understand. I kiss her and sigh. I explained last night. I have to go onto the roof and turn back into a gargoyle. I'll be across the street. On top of the library. I'll be back tonight. She rolls over and sits up, rubbing her eyes. You were serious? This isn't some weird game. No. I shake my head, a strange laugh bubbling in my gut. It's been so long since I spoke to a human properly. I've forgotten how little of the paranormal world they understand. Would you like to watch my brothers and me fly over to the library and shift into our stone forms? She hesitates for a moment, then nods. I pull her up, a strange ache tugging at my heart. I'm going to miss you today. More than you know. Me too. Please don't go. Her words tug at my heart, but I have no choice. The rules of my world and life are set in stone, as immovable as me and my brothers during the day. I must. But please be here when I come home. Or I will find you. The latter doesn't need to be said. My heart will find her, no matter where she goes now. If there is one thing I remember from my reading of the beloved scriptures, it is the connection. Once united, the bond is considered so powerful that a gargoyle could find his beloved even if separated by half the world. Come see. And please don't be scared. I could never hurt you, ever. I don't want you to worry about this. She nods as I tug her out of bed, wrap her in a blanket, and dress in my comfortable black jeans and white t-shirt. The boys are up, I warn her, so she knows what to expect when we join them on the balcony. I can hear my brothers preparing for the flight. Nate Gabes and Rafe all stand ready to fly, and they turn as one as I approach with Christiana tucked beneath my arm. Brothers, this is my beloved Christiana. Chrissy, you met Rafe already. This is Gabe and Nate. My brothers nod, their faces strained with the time of day. Their shift is almost upon them. We must go, Rafe says. I know. I nod at him, before kissing Christiana on the top of her head. Then I stand on the balcony ledge. Let's fly. My brothers and I extend our wings, and together we arch into flight off the balcony. I hear Christiana's cry as she rushes to the ledge and feel a moment's regret at not taking more time to explain everything properly. We soar through the air, landing on the top of the New York Library. My brothers go to their respective corners, and I take my place at the front of the building, crouching low, kneeling on one knee with my hand in a claw-like position. I lift my eyes to see my beloved's red hair blowing in the breeze as the sun begins to rise. Heat sears my flesh, and the weight of my stone cast presses down upon me. Chapter 4 Christiana Watching Roman jump from the rooftop with his gorgeous brothers, 
is one of the scariest things I've ever witnessed. Roman's wings extend, thank goodness, but I can't see any wings on the other three. But when I rush forward, expecting to see them plummeting to their deaths, I am shocked to see them gliding over to the building opposite. The State Library. Weirdest thing I have ever seen. Then things get even more creepy and amazing. There on the roof of the library, the men move to the posts I am sure are usually occupied by large, grotesque-looking stone gargoyles. Then, to my utter astonishment, they bend down into strange positions. The sunlight hits, and right before my eyes they turn to stone. Just like that. My mouth hangs open. I can't even say it must be my eyes playing tricks on me. They might be a decent distance away, but my eyesight is impeccable. They turned into gargoyles. I scurry back to Roman's bedroom, my heart pounding so loud in my ears I can barely think for all the noise. What on earth have I gotten myself into? I sink back into bed and lie there wrapped in the blanket for goodness knows how long. The apartment is quiet, and my stomach growls. Do they eat? Yes, they must. I saw Roman eat steak last night. But will they have food in the apartment? Only one way to find out. I push myself out of bed and go to pull on my clothes from the night before. I stare at them in my hand and I can't do it. They are dirty and smell of fear and Greg. No way am I putting those on my body again. Despite the shock of what I've just seen, I feel changed and in a good way. I open the lid of my suitcase and stare down at my clothes. Clothes from my old life. None of it appeals, and yet, what else am I going to wear? Maybe. I walk over to the two doors leading out of Roman's bedroom. One of the doors leads into a huge ensuite with a large tub. Definitely need a soak in that. The other leads to a walk in wardrobe, filled mostly with jeans and white t shirts of different cuts. He certainly likes what he likes. I take one of the only long sleeve shirts down from the rack and walk into the huge bathroom. If Roman has told me the truth and it is so fantastical, I just have to believe it, then I have all day until he comes home. I flick the taps on the bath and let the hot water fill the tub, steam clouding the mirrors and surrounding me in a relaxed atmosphere. A good long soak is just what I need, and when the tub is mostly full, I slide in and let the heat wash everything away. How have I ended up here? Yesterday, I was in a dead-end job and living with a horrible, abusive man. Now I am lying in a hot tub, in a multi-million dollar apartment, having had the best sex of my life with a virtual stranger. A stranger who turns into a stone monster and sits atop a city building every day. Talk about a Cinderella story. Cinderella with a difference. A giggle floats out of my mouth and I sink beneath the water, scrubbing my hair with my nails beneath the surface. I push up again and break the surface. What am I going to do about work? I look around and remember Roman's words. Sure he's rich. And I love the fact that he saved me from my pitiful existence. But I want to be useful too. Maybe I can help with the security side of things. Not literally, of course, but I am a pretty good people organizer, and I am sure I could help in some way. I float and swim in the tub until I'm so hungry my belly is in pain from the cramps. I pull myself out of the tub, towel myself dry, and grab some fresh knickers and a bra. Wearing Roman's shirt makes me feel close to him, and he's so big, the tails go all the way down to my knees. I have a black belt attached to one of my dresses, so I pull it off and wrap it around the shirt. When I glance in the mirror for the first time in my life, my red ringlets don't bother me, nor does my awkward nose. Both of those things were commented on in a derogatory way, often by Greg. With Roman, even though he is big, powerful, and incredibly sexy, he seems to accept and want me exactly as I am. Though I am still reeling from the magical gargoyle thing, I am ignoring that side of things at the moment. I will face it later. I sneak into the huge kitchen, half expecting someone to jump out at me. The remote control is on the table, so I flick on the TV, turning the volume to low, just so I have some background noise to break up the silence. In the fridge, there is meat. And meat. And more meat. 
Not my first choice for breakfast, but with hunger gnawing at me, what other option do I have? There is one frying pan in the huge cupboards, so I cook the steak and then sit down at the glass table by myself to eat. It is a strange feeling, and suddenly I wonder if I am being watched. A shiver courses down my spine. Time to get out of the apartment. I run back to the bedroom, pulling on a pair of leggings and boots with a slight cringe. I have some secret savings that Greg hadn't gotten to. I can afford to buy a few new pieces of clothing, until I get another job. Anything from my old world now seems dirty for some reason. I move to the front door and open it, jumping back with a start as the security guard from last night turns to face me. Good morning, he says. Um, hi. I'm Chrissy. I'm Bill, ma'am. Will you be needing a car? An escort somewhere? He is showing me all the respect that he gave Roman. Wow. Me? No. I just wanted to get out for a bit. Maybe go over to the library. He nods once. Then I'd better come with you. None of the men over there know you, and they tend to shoot first and ask questions later. Shoot first? I swallow hard. That sounds um bad. What sort of men have Roman and his brothers hired? And is the danger they face really that bad that they need that level of security? A small smile quirks up his lips. Yes, ma'am. I'll lock up and head over with you. Oh, thank you. He pulls the door shut behind us, clicking and flicking the locks. All right, he says. Let's go. We ride the elevator down, and for the first time in my life, I am escorted by a security guard across the road and into the library. It is a little scary, yet also faintly exhilarating. Bill is older than I am, and has a sense about him that makes me feel safe in his presence. I feel like he is loyal to Roman, and a kind person. I'm not sure how I know, but I feel it in my gut. Are you going to take me to, Roman? I am. If you'd like to see him? Bill asks, his tone the gentlest I've heard so far. Yes. I would. Despite the fact that I have no idea how I feel about the gargoyle thing, I have to face it sooner rather than later. We ride the ancient elevator up to the top floor, and then step out onto the roof. A cool breeze blows my hair around my face and I take a slow, deep breath. I haven't tied it up, because I already know Roman prefers it down. He told me so last night, when he kept running his fingers through it and caressing my scalp. I can hear my heart beating in my ears, a loud thudding sound that makes my arms and legs tingle at the same time. Bill moves away, and I turn to follow him. Five armed men in black, who were covertly positioned all over the rooftop, step forward. I swallow hard, my stomach rolling at the implied danger. They nod to Bill, who takes a moment to speak quietly to them, and then he walks back to me. They're fine. You can go see Roman if you like. Part of me isn't sure I want to, anymore. This is getting creepier by the second. Would you walk over with me? He nods and puts a gentle hand around my waist, guiding me over to the edge of the ancient building. There's Rafe. He's the biggest by far. I nod, a part of my brain in total shock at what I am seeing this close. Bill is pointing to a stone gargoyle. A statue. A grotesque creature with wings, fangs, and a tail. How can that be the huge, handsome man I saw last night? And there's Roman. The head of the building. I don't want to look. Because I know what I am going to see, and part of me is afraid. But it has to be done. I force myself to turn to follow where Bill points. And there he is. Roman. My beautiful rescuer. My gargoyle monster. My heart races in my chest, and the need to flee pulses through my bloodstream. Roman is a monster. There's no other way to describe what I'm seeing. Reality kicks in as the thought freezes in my head. I had sex with a monster. A sharp-toothed, winged creature that I know nothing about. Is this how I wanted to spend the rest of my life? Visiting my man, gargoyle, whatever during the day on the roof of the state library? What sort of life will we have if I only see him during the night hours? Tears threaten my vision, 
and I release a pent-up sob. I can't do this. He isn't even human. My legs turn to jelly and yet I force them to run. I turn and bolt across the roof like someone is chasing me, adrenaline zinging through my system. I reach the elevator, my breathing labored and coming hard. But no one is chasing me, and Bill stares after me with sad eyes that make my own tears well even faster and fall down my cheeks. I press my finger into the button over and over, until the door finally closes and I sink to the floor against the wall. What have I done? I need to get away from him, and yet how? I have no job, no money, and practically only have the clothes I stand up in. I look down at my crumpled form, a hysterical laugh bursting out. What clothes? I'm wearing some leggings and Roman shirt. The doors ding open and strangers stare down at me. Are you all right? An older lady asks me, and I push myself to my feet, embarrassment flushing up my neck with a heated blush. Yes. Thank you. Walking isn't easy, but I push myself to continue through the library and onto the New York Street. Where am I going to go? What will I do? I will never see Roman again. Even as that thought hits my mind, my body collapses in on itself. Pain shoots through me like a knife has been driven into my heart. I can't bear the thought of never seeing him again. It feels like my heart is being torn in two. I flop onto a park bench, barely able to breathe, a cold sweat breaking out on my forehead. What has he done to me? This isn't right. I need to get further away from him. But the more steps I take, the worse the pain gets. I can feel a panic in my heart that is not my own. Whose is it then? I glance up at the gargoyle that is Roman. An impossible story. Yet I have seen too much evidence even in such a short space of time to doubt it now. Are we soulmates? Is that part of it true, too? Is that why I feel this panic deep inside? Because I can feel what he feels even though he is currently stone and unmoving. No. This can't be true. I force my legs, heavy like they've been weighted down with lead to move. One step in front of the other. The pain, the desolation, the sadness that weigh me down are like a storm of grief. God. No. I stop and sit down again on another bench. What am I fighting against? This is not making any sense. I slow my breathing. I have to think with my head, not my fear. Maybe I am acting too rashly? What am I really running away from? A man who has said he will look after me sexually, financially, and if I allow him to, emotionally as well. Not that he is a man, and that is the problem. Perhaps I need to wait, ask more questions. Running away from the prince, just as the clock struck twelve, was probably Cinderella's greatest mistake. I take a few more steadying breaths. I should have asked him more about his life last night. But the passion simply overtook me, and the need to sleep and rest afterward had been unfightable. The whole night was magical, or something akin to it. I've never felt anything like it before, and I am pretty sure I won't ever feel the same thing again if I run away from Roman now. But he turns into a stone statue. I shake out my hands and roll my neck, the stiffness and pain in my body keeping me seated. At least he isn't a real monster. No matter what he looks like in his stone form, Roman has already proven that he has a good heart. Greg is a real monster. A fire-breathing asshole who likes to hurt women. Who loved to hurt me, every chance he could get. I somehow know that Roman would never hurt me. Of course, this doesn't make any sense, yet my intuition is adamant. The way Roman looks at me, his very demeanor shouts, protector. After the life I've had, I could use some protecting. Okay, maybe give it another night. Talk to him. I force myself to my shaking legs once again, pain still constricting my ribs. I take a step back toward the apartment, and the pain eases a fraction. I straighten up taller, take another step, and the pain lessens again. I force another step, then another, until I am back inside the brightly lit apartment building. Happiness floods me as all the pain disappears and an artificial high floods my brain. I can breathe again. Bill steps into the foyer behind me. 
Ma'am, would you like to return to the apartment? Oh, that's right. I don't even have a key. Thank you, Bill. I, I'm sorry about that. He inclines his head in an understanding way. It's fine. I found it quite confronting the first time I saw it, also. We ride up in the elevator, and Bill lets me back into the apartment. I turn back around. Oh. I, do you think I could order some food? He smiles properly this time. Absolutely. Call room service on 202 and order anything you like. I know Roman and his brothers have a very limited diet, and I'm sure they'd like you to have all that you need. Thank you. Yes, Roman hadn't had much time to think about my food needs yet. The way he told the story it was like he saw me, had to have me, and took me home without a second thought. No time to think about what a human would need to eat. A strange smile picks up my lips. A human. I never thought I'd be dating someone who wasn't. I pick up the phone and order whatever I can think of to eat, and ask for the full menus to be sent up too. There are still a few hours until sundown, and I need to eat and sleep. Because tonight I have questions and I want them answered. Chapter 5 Roman She left me. Ran away, as though I was the most horrible creature imaginable. Why would she do that? What have I done wrong? Is it my gargoyle form that repels her? Disgusts her? As the hot yellow sun fades into the distance amidst a splatter of red and orange hues, my heart aches from the day of regrets. I should have done things so differently with Christiana. I should have wooed her properly, gotten to know her. She needs her questions answered, and I should have given her the time to get acquainted with what and who I am. Before I took her to bed. Instead though, I rushed both of us into this life, this union, and I don't even know if she wants me now. My brothers stretch from their stony positions, and I stand up, strangely more comfortable in my skin than I was yesterday. There is less pain, and I find myself eager to stand up and move around. Very unusual for me, at least lately. I jump up onto the roof and join my brothers in a circle. I need to go home. Nate grins. Yeah, we know. You're the one who's found his beloved. I suppose your days of flying through the streets of New York with us are done. I force a smile to my face. I should be happy that I have Christiana, but all I can think about are the feelings that flowed through me when she arrived on the roof to see me. So much pain and panic. From my own body. Or hers. I couldn't tell. But she is calm now and I believe she is in my home again. Yes. Back home tonight. No partying for me. My brothers smirk and head off on their night of carousing. I step up onto the stone balustrade and stretch out my wings, hearing the cotton of my t-shirt rip as they expand. I lean forward, soaring through the air and climbing up, and up to my home. I land, both feet on the balcony of my penthouse apartment, a strange caution making me wonder what I will find when I get inside. I step up to the glass door and push it open. Christiana is sitting cross-legged on the couch, an array of food spread out before her. Roman. Her tone is warm, her eyes soft, as she untangles herself from her blankets and makes her way over to me. Hi. She smiles up at me, and I grab her with both hands kissing her as passionately as I dare, sampling the sweetness of her mouth, all the while, a cold hand wraps around my heart. Despite the warmth in her expression, something is wrong. Are you all right? I ask. She doesn't answer but instead takes my hand and leads me to the couch, pulling me down beside her. She looks me directly in the eye. I'm not sure I can do this. The cold hand squeezes tighter. Do what? Be with you. But you are with me. What is hard about this? I try to remain positive and gesture to the room around us. You have a beautiful home to live in, room service, personal guards. What else do you need, Christiana? Tell me and I will give it to you. She cocks her head. I want to be able to see you during the day. Spend time with you. I open my mouth to answer and nothing comes out. 
She has asked for the one thing I cannot give. I clear my throat and try again. That is impossible and not necessary. She looks down and away. Then we aren't going to work. Panic flutters in my heart, and yet I reach for the little bit of knowledge I have on beloved unions. Once formed, they are practically impossible to break, are they not? Christiana, we are linked now by something much stronger and greater than both of us. You cannot simply stop wanting it to be there. This connection of ours is forever. She lifts her gaze, her eyes suspiciously shiny. Is that what I was feeling today? Maybe all that pain and panic I was feeling had been hers. What were you feeling? When I tried to walk away from the library, it felt like someone was squeezing my heart, trying to break my ribs. It was so painful. It only eased when I made the decision to come back here and wait for you. I know exactly what she felt today. The same sensations, the same agony and pain echoed in my chest for most of the day. I take both of her small hands in mine. I don't know if that was the union or me. I could see you running away, and I was devastated. You may have been sensing my pain. Her eyebrows draw together in a furrow. What do you mean? How could you see me? I sigh. This is not good. I've hardly explained anything. I really didn't have time to tell you much about myself last night, did I? She shrugs. Very little. I have so many questions. Questions are good. Then ask them. That is the evil here, a lack of understanding and knowledge. Not us. Not our union. We are meant to be together, Christiana. Fate has decreed it. A tear drips onto her cheek, and she pulls her hand away from mine to wipe it away. All right. Tell me more about everything. Well, to start with, I am fully conscious during the day. Even when frozen in stone, I can hear and see everything going on around me. I'm the same on the inside, with the same feelings and thoughts and emotions. Her gaze snaps up to mine, obviously interested. When do you sleep? We don't. The daytime hours are for our rest and healing. We never actually sleep. We watch over the city. In the early years, we were like this city's guardian angels. We would witness crimes during the day and hunt down the culprits at night. But the city has gotten too busy, and my brothers and I are tired. She was nodding obviously trying to absorb everything I was telling her. So I can never see you in the day. Ever. I run a hand through my hair. This is the one thing I cannot change, even if I wanted to. It is what and who I am. I wish I could. Do you know how frustrating it is, to be locked inside a body that is frozen? To never feel the sun on your true skin? If I could take away this curse on my life, I would. I promise. But it is the price I pay for immortality. She looks thoughtful and far away. But I. Is being a creature of the night such a bad thing? In a city such as this. A city that never sleeps. I suppose not. It's just that I am still struggling with all of this. A day ago I was a waitress and now. You are my beloved. She sits up straighter shifting into her cross-legged position again. Tell me about that. Well, I will tell you what I know. It is a long time since I spoke to an elder about this. All gargoyles are male, made through an ancient god. And every one of us has a fated mate, a beloved, a soulmate you called it last night. Well, you are mine and I am yours. Last night while we united, our hearts were fused. Now I cannot be without you, and you cannot be without me. Her large blue eyes grow wider, her mouth falling open. So you're telling me I'm trapped? I have no choice in this. Her eyes begin to well up and my heart pounds. No. Please don't see it like that. We are all puppets in the game of fate. You and I are destined to be perfect halves of the one whole. Why can you not see how perfect that is? She begins to cry in earnest this time, tears rolling down her face. I can't stand it. My heart breaks for her. I pull her into my arms, kissing her face, her hair, anywhere I can reach. 
She clings to me like a small child. Everything is going to be okay. I whisper the words hoping they comfort her, but she continues to sob and cry. I rock her, unable and unwilling to let her go. When she finally quiets, I wipe the moisture from her face. Am I really such a terrible proposition? This time I try a teasing tone. She shakes her head, still mopping up the moisture on her face. I stare down at the tears, unable to imagine what it is like to show such emotion in such a way. No, it's not you. I just don't understand any of this. It's all so new and scary. And the fact that I can't even get away if I want to. She shakes her head, sadness and despair pouring off her in waves. I hug her tight, and she grabs onto me like a lifeline in a storm. I reach for a partial truth, something to give us time enough for her to feel comfortable in this new life. How about this? You give me a month to see if you can love me, as I'm sure I can love you. If you are still not happy and want to leave, I will go to an elder in Canada and ask how we break this connection we have. It would probably kill me to do so, but what would that matter? An existence without my beloved Christiana would be a truly hellish existence. She lifts her head, her sky-blue eyes filling with astonishment and wonder. You do that for me? Of course I would. I'd bring you the sun and the moon if it was in my power to do so. A ghost of a smile creeps across her luscious pink lips. Now, are there any more questions tonight? She shakes her head. Are you sure, because I am here and I will tell you anything you want to know? She bites her lip and looks at me with a changed expression. Will you take me to bed again? A growl rolls through my chest as I scoop her up and walk into our bedroom. I don't need to answer her. My actions say enough. I make love to her so many times I lose count. Until my heart beats in time with hers, and her soft moans and sighs echo in my head as familiar as my own thoughts. When I stagger out of the room in the early morning to my brother's catcalls, I can only grin with joy. I will convince her she has to stay. I have to. Or die trying. Chapter 6 Christiana Sunshine fills the bedroom with bright yellow rays. It has to be past noon and I don't care. My life has no clock to run it anymore. I roll over in the huge bed, beautifully sore from the most passionate night of my life. The clock reads one page M. Wow. I've slept half the day away. I pull myself out of the warm bed, visit the bathroom, then go to dive back under the covers. But my stomach is hurting from a lack of food. I wonder if they stocked up at all. Probably not. I'll have to go shopping soon. I pull on some fresh clothes, grabbing one of Roman's many white t-shirts and taking a deep sniff. This one is new, and smells only faintly of the man I love. Wait huh? Oh damn. I've fallen in love with him already. A smile spreads over my face as I dance my way into the huge living room. So I am in love with a man I've known two days, and who is a gargoyle during the daylight hours. No one has ever said I am completely sane, but that is a whole other level of crazy. I ring down to room service, order up some lunch, and head out into the sunshine on the balcony. To think, the man I just spent the night making love to is now over there, on top of the library, pondering life as a frozen statue. Can he see me, sitting here in the warm sun? In one corner of the balcony is a telescope that I didn't notice yesterday. Either I was blinded by everything else going on, or someone put it up here for me. If it's new, it was probably Bill. The security guard has been super nice to me since I arrived. I close one eye and look through the telescope. I can see only windows and buildings. I move the scope around until I can see the top of the library, the gargoyles protecting the city coming into view at the center of the building. A giggle escapes my lips. Who would ever believe me if I told them? I pull back and something catches my eye. Flashes of black and movement. I go back to the scope and when I focus, a gasp escapes my lips at the horrible picture unfolding before me. Men are on top of the roof, shooting the gargoyles' daytime guards. 
There are three, four, no, five of them. Oh, one of the guards knifed a bad guy. Holy shit. I dash for the front door and find Bill just outside, passed out, lying against the wall. No. I feel for his neck, and there is still a pulse. I'll call a paramedic, Bill. I promise. I've gotta go. I unhook the gun from his belt and grab it, the weight of the weapon heavy and cold in my hand. I bang at the elevator button, to call it up to me. Come on. Come on. What did Roman say about their immortality? That they could be killed in statue form? Oh fuck. What if I don't get there in time? The doors open finally, and I run inside, hitting the ground button and holding my breath as the carriage descends. Please no one stop me on the way down. I grip the revolver in my hand, and shift my weight from foot to foot. My dad taught me a bit about guns before he died. I can shoot this thing if I have to. The elevator hits the ground floor, and I tap my foot as I wait for the doors to open. Hurry up. When they do, I run like a shot, straight over the busy road, into the library, and up the stairs. I am not waiting for that stupid elevator, while my man could be dying. My heart pounds, my legs scream, but I keep running. Then I reach the top floor. I slow my breathing, though my heart is pounding like a jackhammer. Shoot to kill. There's no other way. A wave of panic, fear, and then a strong wave of anger flows over me. Roman. He can see everything that is happening, but he won't be able to do anything. Same with his brothers. My poor sweetheart. This is it. I clench my teeth, raise the gun, flick off the safety and push open the door. There is a bleeding guard by the door, who sees me, then pushes a gun toward me. I bend to pick it up in my other hand, and head out into the cold air with two weapons drawn and ready. There is still a fight going on, and half the guards are down. Two of the bad guys are shooting at the gargoyles, and I level both guns at them, aiming for their heads as I can see they wear bulletproof vests. I squeeze the triggers and bang, the recoil shoots right up my arms. The man on the right's head explodes, and the one on the left jumps down and whirls on me. I level both guns at him, and squeeze again, his face disappearing before my very eyes as the bullets disintegrate his skull like an explosive. There are still gunshots going off, and I run to the edge of the roof to see a smaller man shooting pieces off two of the gargoyles and pushing Rafe to the edge. No. I scream and swing my right arm around. The man's gaze connects with mine, and we both fire. Pain explodes through my left shoulder, but he falls backwards off the building and away from the men I am trying to protect. I clamp my hand down onto the fire burning in my arm. Fuck. There are sirens. The police or paramedics are getting close. How is that possible? Has someone seen the fight and called them? I haven't had a chance to call them yet. I look up and see the guard by the door still slumped, but he raises his arm and gives me a thumbs up. He must have called them. Thank God. The guards that are still alive are trying to stand, and the rest are dead. My gaze darts around but I can't see any danger. Which is a very good thing. Relief flows over me. Blood oozes out between my fingers, and black spots are forming in my vision. The adrenaline leaches out of my system, and I get dizzy, drifting in and out of consciousness. Finally, the blackness swallows everything, and I sink into oblivion. When I wake up, I am in a sterile white hospital room, and doctors are talking over me. Can you tell me your name? the man asks. Christiana Barry. Where am I? Where's Roman? You were shot on the top of the state library. How are you feeling? The light hurts my eyes. Tiny miners must have taken pickaxes to the back of my eyeballs. I have a headache. We'll increase your pain meds. Sleep if you can, and the police will be in to question you tomorrow. That won't be good. But thanks to the drugs they stick in my arm, I go back to sleep. During the night, Roman sneaks in and takes me out of the hospital. I think he flies me through the air at one point, but the medication makes me so dippy, I am not sure if I'm hallucinating or not. Chapter 7 Roman
I lay my beautiful beloved down in our bed, her shoulder bandaged up, her usually healthy complexion as pale as an eggshell. Is she okay, brother? Gabe asked, squeezing my arm. I believe so. The doctor seemed to think she'll be fine physically, plus, as we have united, she should heal as we do. But she doesn't shift, so I'm unsure of how her immortality works. Then what concerns you? I sigh. She was concerned about us before this happened. She wasn't sure she would be able to handle our paranormal world. What will she do now, Gabe? I won't blame her if she wants to run half a world away. Gabe shakes his head, his long blonde hair covering half his face. No. You are united. She cannot leave. Plus, we owe her a debt. I don't believe any of us would be here tonight if it weren't for her. Those men had the jump on our guards if she hadn't taken them down. What would we have awoken to, brother? If we had awoken at all? I think we would all be dead. I nod, a strange sadness filling me up that Christiana had to experience such violence. I didn't think she had it in her. My weak little human. Weak. You've never been a good judge of character, brother. Take it from me. This girl is everything you need. Let her heal, give her time. She will be part of our family now. Speaking of family, how is Raphael? I turn, giving Gabe my full attention. Gabe grimaces and tucks his hair behind one of his ears. He's pretty bad. Most of the damage they did to him will be permanent. There's no way of repairing his face or his arm. If I were able to cry, this would be the time for it. My beautiful brother, a beast in both his forms. Instead, I turn to anger, my hands fisting into balls, a growl rumbling through my chest. Who could have done such a thing? Why? Tell me why they did this. Gabe hustles me out onto the balcony, so I don't disturb Christiana. We don't know, and thanks to your beloved finishing them all off, great shot she is by the way, we don't have anyone to question. Have you spoken to anyone from the Chicago crew? Yes, and they're as much at a loss as we are, unfortunately. There's nothing to go on. These men are ghosts. But our kinsmen think these lunatics will strike again. Gabe nodded. Absolutely. We need to change strategies. We aren't safe on the library anymore. I know but we don't have anywhere else to go. As far as we know, we can't exist anywhere else as gargoyles. Anytime one of us tries to, the pain is excruciating. I look back through the windows to my bedroom, my beloved's energy calling to me even in her sleep. I need to go back. Do. Be safe. I leave Gabe out on the balcony and move inside, Christiana's eyelids flutter awake as I move to sit next to her and take her hand. Roman. She swallows hard and licks her lips. I grab a bottle of water and hold it to her mouth. She drinks and smiles gratefully. You came for me. Of course I did. I couldn't leave you in that hospital to be poked and questioned. I'll have a private doctor see to you. Everything will be okay. She blinks sleepily up at me. I love you, Roman. I have to say it, in case something else happens to you. Or to me. Stop, beautiful. You are immortal. Just like me. You need to heal. Nothing will happen now. I bloody hope it won't happen. I've hired new staff and doubled our security. I don't know what else I can do. Maybe buy her a sniper gun and sit it on the balcony? She grabs my hand and squeezes tight, her eyes fluttering open and closed. No. Listen. I do. You saved me from a dead-end life, and I want to stay. I have to ask just once. Why were you ever with that man? You are such a beautiful woman, and he is such a... I can't find the words. She sighs, her head dropping down so that I can't see her face. I tap up her chin so that she has to look at me. Christiana. I'm not criticizing you, I promise. I just want to know about your life. She gives me half a smile. When I finished school, my parents died, and I didn't have anyone to turn to. 
I came to the city, got a couple of different jobs, and after a while I met Greg. I thought he was well nice. He wooed me with dinners and nice words. And after struggling for so long, I thought my life would be easier with him. But it wasn't. All his fake flattery was just a way to get me do what he wanted. At home. At work. And he has a temper. I wanted to run away, but where could I go? I felt trapped, and I didn't want to be alone again. He'd been there for so long. I just... I pulled her lips up to kiss them, loving the softness of them beneath my own. I understand, I say, although part of me doesn't. As a paranormal, and a man, I would never need to rely on anyone for anything. But you don't need to ever feel like that again. I want you to be happy. I want you to feel loved. Complete. Just as you are. And I promise you, I will always love you. No matter what, she asks, her voice barely a whisper. I chuckle. No matter what. That is our beloved union. You can count on it. She nods, her eyes clearing so that I can see the intelligence in her gaze. Then it has to go both ways. This union, this love. I want to help you. You need someone to watch over you as you rest during the day. My heart breaks and is remade in the image of her face. What an incredibly beautiful soul fate has blessed me with. I'm not sure how safe that would be, my beloved. She whacks me in the shoulder. Hey. You just told me that I'm as immortal as you are. And I think I proved tonight I can look after myself. Thanks to my dad and some gun lessons. I want to know what the plan is. Because obviously, I've landed in the middle of something pretty big. I take a breath. Yes, it is probably time to have the more detailed talk we should have had that very first night. You already know so much or have inadvertently learned. I search my mind. I may as well start at the beginning. I am a gargoyle shifter born that way. As are my brothers. We are 125 years old, immortal, and bound to the sunrise and sunset for our form. I cannot change that. I am sorry. Though I know you would like it. Just as you are a woman and human. I am a man at night and a gargoyle during the daytime hours. Can you accept that? She stills for a moment then nods once. Yes. I accept that. Then there is the matter of our union. You are my beloved. My soulmate. And I am yours. Will you allow me to love you and show you, through all time, that we are meant to be together? Her eyes shimmer with tears and she smiles up at me. Only if you let me love you the same way. I bow my head, lift her fingers and kiss the knuckles of her soft hand, humbled to the very center of my being. And finally, we must talk about the danger our family faces, as I must beg of you to accept my brothers as your family too. I know I said we may live wherever you wish, but until this threat passes. She hushes me. Shish, no. Don't be silly. I grew up an only child with no siblings, and now I have no parents. It would be an honor to live here and be a part of your family. Especially with Rafe needing help now. Horror strikes a deep chord in my heart. Rafe. My handsome brother. He will not take his disfiguration well. He has always enjoyed his status as the best looking of us all, and now we have no idea if he will ever recover from the trauma of the attack. Where to now, Roman? Now we try to work out who is attacking us and why. We double our security, and we talk to the elders. I need to know what these men want. I do too. What did you guys ever do to them? She asks, her tone angry. Nothing. We don't interfere with humans at all. She smiles up at me. I love that you interfered in my life, Roman. I grin. You are the exception to every one of my rules, and always will be. She giggles happily and settles her head deeper into the pillow, her eyelids beginning to fall once again. I love you too, Christiana, light of my life. Now sleep and I'll watch over you. She nods and drifts off to sleep again. I stand up and walk to the window, 
watching our busy city rumble and flare around me. We are at war, with a hidden enemy, and I have more than myself and my brothers to protect now. I have my beloved. No one, not even those evil enough to attack us during the day, will tear her away from me. The battle is far from over. I sense with every part of me that it is only just beginning. The End Continue the adventure with Book 2, Beauty and the Gargoyle. Or listen on for a sneak peek into Book 2. Chapter 1 Raphael The mirror casts back an image that I cannot equate as being my face. How could this happen to me, this terrible disfigurement that I can barely bring myself to look at, let alone know that others have to view it too? I wish I could be certain that one day, I will go to rest in my gargoyle state and wake up healed and rejuvenated. But I'm not certain at all. Every time I've been injured in my human form, my shifter genes heal everything. Not this time though. This time I was in gargoyle form when I was shot with a gun and part of my face and shoulder were taken right off. Seems like the rules are different when the injury happens in gargoyle form. Or at least it seems that way so far. Hey Rafe. Want some dinner? Christiana, my brother Roman's new beloved, calls out to me from the kitchen. Gabe and Nate, two of my other brothers, have gone out on the town, partying, drinking, and screwing around like nothing has happened. Like my life hasn't been turned upside down. Like people aren't trying to kill us while in our frozen statue state. When we are unable to fight back. Yes. I'm coming. I call out though I don't really want to face the beautiful woman who is sizzling up some steak for me. Luckily, she doesn't even blink when she sees me now, and I love her for that. I gather what little pride I have left, and open my bedroom door, move into the kitchen, and sit down at the counter. Here you go. I cooked too, if you can even call searing the outside cooking, but there's more if you're hungry. She gives me a brilliant smile as she sets the tea bones in front of me, blood oozing from between the sear marks on the flesh. No. That's perfect. Thank you. As gargoyle shifters, my brothers and I have incredibly sharp teeth, and eat only red meat. Occasionally the desire stirs in me to try some fresh bread, or a fragrant piece of cheese, but my body hurls it up faster than I can swallow it. No compromising on the rules of being a gargoyle. Is Roman here? I ask between mouthfuls, my stomach grumbling with the first tastes of food since I awoke. No. He's gone off to some meeting with a banker. Or something. She shrugs as though she doesn't know and doesn't care. But there is more to Christiana than first appears. I owe my life to this petite female, and as far as I'm concerned, she's earned the right to sit around the apartment doing nothing for the rest of her days if that's what she chooses. But doing nothing is not Christiana's style. I was actually hoping I could ask you something, she says, her tone a little too soft. I nod, continuing to eat. I want to go back to work. I know I don't have to, she rushes to add. Roman keeps telling me I never have to work again, that you guys have heaps of money. We do. A hundred years of investments and properties, and we're set. Not to mention the fact that with immortality staring us all in the face, the last thing we are is materialistic. You can have anything you want, Chrissy. I mean that. She screws up her face like a child tasting something new. Beautiful little human. I don't want to live like that. If Roman is right and our union makes me immortal too, I can't just sit around on my ass every day while you guys rest on the library roof. You should be sleeping so you can stay up with us all night, I suggest. Chrissy still keeps relatively normal human hours, sleeping from about 2 a.m. to lunchtime. Which doesn't please Roman. But I think a part of her is still clinging to her humanity. That will change with more time, I'm sure. I'm going to start applying for some jobs. Maybe a local cafe. That wasn't a good idea. No. We need you. Roman needs you. I almost said, don't be selfish, but saying that to a woman who took a bullet for us is low. Even for me, and I'm in the worst state of my life. She pouts and flops down onto a stool opposite me. 
I grin at her dramatics. You've already put our cleaner out of a job. Chrissy huffs and crosses her arms. I didn't mean to. I just can't sit around while she cleans and I've got nothing to do. I like looking after our home. Well, after a hundred years or so, I'm sure the novelty will wear off. She sticks out her tongue, and I want to tug on her ponytail. Chrissy pouts again. Well, if I ever get sick of looking after the house, you can hire a cleaner again, but for now, I need something to do. I see her frustration and empathize with it. Suddenly having forever stretch out before you like a long, empty road is an intimidating thing. I'm sure you can find something to fill your time. Maybe ask Bill or Roman about helping with the daytime security stuff. Maybe working at the library or something. Do you like computers? I know Roman's been upset with the defects in his current security system. Why I was throwing ideas at her, I have no clue. Roman was going to have my hide. No. I hate computers. But the library. Yes. Thank you, Rafe. She bounces around on her seat before jumping off and kissing my cheek so quickly, I don't have the chance to flinch away. I put up my hand to my marred cheek and watch her skip away, seemingly unaffected by my damaged flesh. The pain in my chest releases, and I feel as if I can take a deep breath for the first time since waking. Chrissy gives me hope that one day I too will find my beloved, someone who will accept me for who I am, regardless of what I now look like. My chest tightens again as I remember what I see when I look in the mirror. I can't imagine anyone loving a beast like me. I've always been a monster through the day of course. The curse of being born a gargoyle shifter. When the sunlight hits our bodies at sunrise, my three brothers and I turn into grotesque stone statues with tails, fang-like teeth and taloned feet. But when dusk arrives and the darkness releases us from our curse, we are men. And I've always been considered handsome through those nights. Women fall at my feet. Or they did. Once upon a time. Now. I don't dare leave the apartment. I finish my meal and head back to my bedroom. I lie down on the bed my mind a whirling downward spiral of deep loathing and fear. In a few hours, I'll have to step back onto that library roof and transform into my gargoyle shifter once again. I don't have a choice. I will be frozen, defenseless, and alone. Anyone could attack me, just like they did a month ago. A violent shudder runs through my muscles like a cold, electrical current. The memories of that attack still haunt me. For every moment of every day, and every night. I can't see any way out of it. Don't miss out. Click the button below, and you can sign up to receive emails whenever Amelia Shaw publishes a new book. There's no charge and no obligation. https colon slash slash books to read dot com slash r slash b dash a dash wix dash oid c. Connecting independent readers to independent writers. Also by Amelia Shaw. Blood World. Wolf Mated. Dragon Mated. Shadow's Quest. Daughters of the Warlock. Loving the High Warlock. Hiding from the Council. Hidden Sister. Forbidden Love. Arcane Magic. Crown of the Witch. Kingdom of Equality. Dragon King's Collections. Fire and Ice Books 1 to 2. Fire and Ice Books 3 to 5. Fire and Ice Books 6 to 8. Five Twisted Fairy Tales. Freya and the Beast. Forbidden Mates. Prophecy of the Wolf, Coming Soon. Her Wicked Vampires. Tournament of Blood. Ritual of Blood. Scion of Blood, Coming Soon. Pack Loyalty. Love of the Wolf. Destiny of the Wolf. Baby of the Wolf. Curse of the Wolf. Perfect Pairs. Prowling their mate. Stalking their mate. Shadowing their mate. Her Shifter Pack. Her Shifter Mates. Perfect Shifter Pairs. Her Shifter Babe coming soon. Power Magic. Faded to Wolves. 
Mated to Wolves, coming soon. Seasonal Fantasy and Paranormal Romances. Cupid's Love. Seasonal Paranormal and Fantasy Romances. Halloween Promises. A Magical Christmas. Easter Shifter, coming soon. Shifter Rejected Box Sets. The Shifter Rejected Series, Books 1 to 3. The Shifter Rejected Series, Books 4 to 6. Slayer Academy, Why Choose Romance. The Legacy. Fi Hunter. Loving the Fi. The Daughters of the Warlocks box sets. Ava's Coven, Books 1 to 3. Bella's Magic, Books 4 to 6. The Dragon Kings of Fire and Ice. Taken by the Dragon King. A King for the Sorceress. Rebuilding his Dragon Kingdom. The Heir of Winter. The Dragon's True Mate. The Human Mate for the Dragon Prince. The Prince of Dragon Magic. His Dragon Princess. The Future King's Queen, coming soon. Dragon of Her Dreams, coming soon. The Gargoyle Shifters of New York City. Her Knight in Shining Stone. Beauty and the Gargoyle. Sleeping Stone. Her Gargoyle and the Seven Orphans. The Gargoyles Ever After, coming soon. The Paranormal's Blood World. Vampire Mated. The Wolf Shifter Rejected Series. Wolf of Ash. Wolf of Blood. Wolf of Shadows. Wolf of Thorns. Wolf of Bones. Wolf of Starlight. The Woodland Wolf Packs. The Pack's Mate. Claiming Their Mate. Saving the Pack. Why Choose Witches. Alpha Magic. Pack Magic. Wolf Magic. Wicked Fi. The Shifter's Stolen Fi. Shadow Fi Magic. Chosen by the Fi. King Shifter and Queen Fi. Wicked Wolves. Kingdom of Wolves, a paranormal reverse harem romance. Reign of Wolves. Throne of Wolves. Wolf Shifter Pack Loyalty. Fate of the Wolf. Zoe's Revenge. Fi Redemption. Standalone. The Innocent Wolf Mate. Vampire Queen. The Alpha Shifter. The Woodland Wolf Packs. Voodoo and Fate. Cinderella and Fi Charming. Why Choose Halloween Witches, Books 1 to 3. The Paranormal's Blood World, Books 1 to 4. Fallen Angel, Gabriel and Katie The Complete Collection. The Rover Series, Books 1 to 5, Slow Burn Romantic Urban Fantasy. Monster Appetites. Faded Mates Paranormal Romance Box Set. Pack Loyalty, Books 1 to 5. Roar of Neptune. Perfect Pairs. Wicked Fi, Complete Paranormal Romance Series. The Mistress, the Monster and the Marquis. Slayer Academy, Books 1 to 3.